Afternoon and welcome. I'd like to introduce you to Ryan Adams, trainer and head of learning at Instill. Um, Ryan has 20 years in software development, four years in training, and describes himself as still learning. Ryan's going to explore the learning science and aspects of work culture to encourage you to take a more focused approach to learning new things. I'll pass over to Ryan now, but I'd like to think of any questions you may have for Ryan. Um, we may have some time at the end of his session to open questions up to the floor. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That's my test to make sure that my slides are working, so uh, that'll be the way you feel at the end of this talk. Um, so yeah, hello, um, I'm Ryan. I'm Head of Learning uh, at Instill. Um, I spend an awful lot of time in the classroom, and I've, I find myself quite comfortable just kind of talking. It's great when you're online training, and everyone has their screens off, um, and you just start, um, start talking out loud, and, and uh, it doesn't matter whether anybody's listening or not. So thank you for turning up uh, and, uh, and sort of pretending to listen, at least, uh, in person. Um, I've been really encouraged today by a lot of the other presentations. I don't know whether it was just the ones I picked um, or whether um, uh, it was all of the talks, but the, the sort of the discussion about learning at work has come up an awful lot. There's been an awful lot of crossover, so it's been great. Um, and I'm here to talk about learning at work. Uh, and my talk is about learning, uh, and I happen to be a trainer, and I work for a company that does software training. Uh, there will be no promotion of our courses here. Uh, it's not a marketing talk, uh, so uh, you can uh, uh, live easy. Uh, and again, uh, th these slides were built for me by a designer, um, so I, I gave him a, a sample deck, and he, he made them look pretty. Um, and he, there's a lot of text in them, because I'm quoting a lot, uh, and he suggested that I could lighten it up with some GIFs. Um, this is one of my favorite gifts. Uh, I loved Patrick's talk earlier about um, imposter syndrome. Um, and I, I, I feel it all the time. Uh, like I don't start a training course without wondering um, what if I forget everything or what if someone asks me a question I don't know, do I belong here? So I, th I, think, I think it continues. I've been doing programming for 20 odd years and uh, I th it's, it's imposter syndrome just kind of comes and goes and, and uh, I don't know whether we, we can ever get rid of it. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm head of learning uh, at Instill. Uh, that doesn't mean that actually I know what I do. Um, uh, it might mean, might mean that I'm the best at learning. Uh, it probably just means I have a little bit of experience and uh, I can help people get there. Uh, so yeah, so um, the other thing I'll say, um, which is possibly a caveat for this talk, um, uh, is, and is related to imposter syndrome, where if you think of all of the kind of the different experiences and um, skills that people have, uh, it's a bit like Subway sandwiches. Um, there might be 4.5 quadrillion options uh, that, that you need to think about your skill set in a similar way. So just because you look at somebody and thinks, think they're amazing, um, uh, you've got stuff uh, that they don't know uh, and experiences that they haven't had, uh, which makes um, what you have to bring to an experience really important uh, and, uh, uh, and really valuable. Um, so yeah, so um, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, these slides may not make sense, but I hope you learn something uh, and, uh, and find it useful. I want to start uh, officially uh, with, um, with this uh, grand shrine, in, I think it's Isa, Isa Jingu um, in Japan. Um, and uh, it just kind of highlights for me sort of an amazing idea about, maybe it's, maybe it's Japanese culture, um, but if you were to go to Athens uh, and walk around like the Acropolis, um, you would see piles of stones where there were temples once. Uh, and it's almost like in the West, we, we give value to the kind of the artifacts uh, that represent buildings. So, you know, um, uh, Notre Dame burns down and we rebuild it like it was. Uh, but uh, this shrine in Japan uh, is, is rebuilt every 20 years. Uh, in order to ensure that um, the skills that go into making it are, uh, are retained uh, and that um, uh, it's, it doesn't sort of fade away with time. Uh, now, maybe that's because it's made out of wood, but also I think the idea that um, if we don't work uh, at looking after our skills uh, and, and don't kind of practice uh, and keep hold of things, uh, we, um, we lose things. Uh, so uh, this quote, uh, which comes from the Smithsonian Magazine, uh, it's not heroic engineering uh, or structural overkill, it's cultural continuity, which I think also says something about the way organizations you work. Um, we, we focus a lot on engineering excellence, 
um, uh, in, in a kind of our software business. Uh, but you know, culture culture is more important or as important uh, as a lot of that stuff to uh, to ensuring that um, the things have longevity. Uh, so what I, what I really want to say. Um, we retain expertise by continuously learning, uh, by knowing which tool is the right one to pick. Uh, this is my father-in-law's axe collection. Um, and uh, I didn't realize until quite recently uh, that there's a different type of axe, depending on whether you're splitting wood or cutting down trees. Uh, and uh, um, the yellow one is the best one for splitting axe, splitting wood. So there's just this kind of, there's a, there's a knowledge you build up. Um, uh, there's experience you build up. Uh, there's keeping your tools sharp uh, and uh, kind of thinking about how, uh, how we do that. Uh, there's a, a fellow from the 1880s uh, called Herman Ebbinghaus who uh, came up with a concept called the forgetting curve, uh, which some of you may have heard of, um, uh, and an awful lot of stuff that you'll come into um, uh, in modern learning and development stuff uh, is kind of built on that, the idea that you forget stuff over time. Uh, and uh, there's techniques like spaced practice um, or repetition, spaced repetition that, that help you forget uh, help you break the forgetting curve. Uh, so really what we need to do is keep our tools sharp through practice uh, and, uh, and learn which tool is important to use um, through, uh, through some form of learning. So that's, that's also really important, you know, so we, we need to continuously learn stuff uh, is, is another part of my uh, evidence. Um, John Drawn, uh, Canadian academic, works in learning science stuff. Um, uh, I did have a wonderful picture of a crow on this slide, but it didn't make the cut. Um, learning stuff is what makes humans special. Um, it's our unique capability uh, compared to other animals. Uh, so, um, you know, it's important, I think, that we practice that skill uh, and, uh, and kind of think about that and uh, make sure that we are uh, always trying to learn. Uh, he goes on to say, possibly the same article. Um, I can't quite remember, uh, if I'm honest. Um, the more we learn, the more new stuff we are able to learn. So actually stretching yourself creates opportunity for you to learn more stuff uh, and uh, kind of putting yourself into those, some of those challenging situations that we've heard about uh, in some of the other talks actually can be really good um, to, to kind of give us the ability to actually understand and, and learn um, the ability to do something that maybe we couldn't do before. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, it means um, education is a silver bullet. Uh, Sam Seaborn said that. Um, he's a, what was he, his job title was director, deputy director of communications uh, in the White House um, on TV, uh, so he wasn't actually um, uh, a policy maker. Um, but actually I think there's a lot of truth in that, that um, education is the silver bullet, it's the thing that has the biggest impact on um, performance, on productivity, on wealth, on health, on, on society, uh, and so um, uh, everything, uh, education is everything, as, uh, as Sam Seaborn says, uh, which, is, uh, which is really important. Uh, and uh, kind of highlights, I think, the importance of the concept of learning uh, and giving us opportunities to, uh, to kind of get places. Uh, and then, just to introduce some technology, um, Fred Brooks, uh, it's a young photograph of him, I did have an older one. Uh, he said in 1986, uh, when I was a young man, um, uh, there is no silver bullet, uh, there is no single development in either technology or management technique which by itself promises even one order of magnitude as in a tenfold uh, improvement within a decade uh, in productivity and reliability and simplicity. Um, and that, that perspective has largely held true uh, that um, if you ask most people today, uh, is there anything that we can use that might give us a ten times increase in productivity, uh, people will say no, um, although maybe AI. I don't really believe that. Um, uh, so you know, th th there isn't really um, uh, any other uh, way to improve productivity, um, uh, and partly that's because software, um, as as Fred Brooks said, um, is is pure thought stuff, uh, infinitely malleable, uh, kind of suggesting you can't measure it, uh, and uh, and uh, there's lots of kind of interesting stuff uh, to go there. He did say um, that the difference between um, a great design and an average design approaches an order of magnitude. Uh, so the idea that software design um, uh, is a creative process uh, comes from creative minds um, and uh, those creative minds need sound methodology and, and good skills. Um, so you know this point again highlighted the, the most important single effort we can mount uh, is to develop ways to grow great software designers. Um, so um, we're, we're wanting to look at our teams and to 
uh, to think about how, how do I grow my team, how do I make them more productive, um, uh, rather than looking for technology uh, interventions that might uh, improve uh, productivity. So, um, so that's, that's my one little bit of technology. There's another little bit coming up. Um, but just to kind of jump into some learning science um, stuff, uh, social constructivism is one of the most common paradigms for kind of exploring uh, learning uh, and learning in kind of groups and learning in companies and uh, a lot of stuff in, in learning and development again uh, if you've done any kind of uh, uh, learning as part of your, your organization is probably using this technique. Uh, there's a guy called Lev Vygotsky um, who was the scientist who kind of defined a lot of stuff for this. Um, and it's built on the idea of social interaction. Uh, so learning with somebody uh, is, uh, is much easier and much better, uh, and you can learn much better. Uh, he came up with a term called the zone of proximal development, um, which basically says you learn better whenever there's somebody who's an expert there to guide you. Uh, and uh, that um, learning on your own is a difficult process uh, and that we want to get some help. Uh, and there's a sweet spot uh, in terms of um, having confidence that you know what you're doing uh, and know that there's a new thing you're moving into uh, to try and um, to think about how, uh, how that works. Uh, and that's kind of driven by this concept of um, what learners already know. So we're, we're building knowledge on top of stuff that they already know. Uh, and then the way that they interact with others is the key factors uh, in their development. Uh, so the role of the teacher in that uh, is not necessarily to, to kind of to pour knowledge in. There's a there's a concept in learning called banking theory, um, which is basically like, I am the jug and I'm full of knowledge and I'm gonna pour it into your head because uh, you're the mug. Um, uh, and that, that doesn't work um, generally. Uh, so there's a kind of, the, the, the two kind of sides of that coin uh, are me giving you all the expertise uh, or us learning together. Uh, and that's, um, that's how, uh, how things work. Uh, and then just a little, this gaping void was really popular back in the kind of, early 2000s, uh, did a, like a daily cartoon uh, post like this. Um, you used to be able to get posters of this sort of stuff. Um, uh, so nobody has all the answers. You know, teamwork is better. And we know that again, that, that diverse teams and um, relying on our colleagues and software as a team sport and all that stuff uh, comes into play. So um, we need to work together uh, to learn stuff. There's a quote that I have in my head that I don't know the source from uh, that probably doesn't land terribly well, um, but it talks about in a hunter-gatherer society, the best place to store extra meat is in your neighbor. Uh, so if you kill a deer and you can't eat it all, give it to your neighbor and then they'll give you some later. Um, same thing goes for learning. Uh, so uh, if you can help your neighbor learn some stuff uh, or your colleague, then in, in the next time round, they'll come and help you uh, and, uh, and together we'll learn lots more. Um, so we need to learn together uh, from our colleagues. Uh, related to that, uh, Alistair Creelman, uh, um, I think he's maybe Scottish, but he lives in Sweden. Um, uh, and he talks about the challenges of learning. Uh, and uh, this article is really kind of almost, uh, and there's a, a slight criticism of some of the ways that I sometimes teach. In fact, what I'm doing right now uh, is comparing a lecture uh, to a kind of collaborative learning session. Um, uh, you're only really going to learn stuff whenever you actually start grappling with, with the real problems. Uh, I think Patrick said that in his imposter syndrome talk as well earlier on. Um, so you might think you know it. You might listen to a, a talk or you might go to a lecture or you might watch a video. Uh, but actually, until you sit down and get into it, uh, you're not really going to have um, the real learning. Um, and uh, Alistair quotes um, uh, Louis Delorier here. Uh, Deep learning is hard work. Um, and uh, Oftentimes at university, certainly, um, students rate lectures highly. They find them enjoyable. Uh, and they rate practical work poorly. They find it too hard and too difficult and not, not very much fun. Um, and, uh, and actually what that does sort of suggests and that they don't understand that actually in order to learn stuff, it's got to work. Well, learning, is, learning is hard work. Um, uh, so students actually appreciate lectures more because they can relax and enjoy them uh, rather than actually getting stuck in and learning stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's an issue. So some, there's some challenges there for thinking about how we handle um, uh, delivering learning. Uh, and there's challenges for, for me there as a head of learning at a training organization um, to make sure that what we're doing in our training courses is one that, that kind of inf um, gives the, the, the students, the delegates, time uh, to work through problems in groups uh, and, uh, and learn, learn some tough things. 
so yeah, so let's, let's talk about, um, about learning at work. So learning, learning is important. I hope people have seen that, um, that we need to kind of hone our skills. Uh, there are various sort of techniques to do that. Um, there's a sense that I tend to get uh, that technologists are special. I think we like to think of ourselves as special. There's a, there's a, a tweet that you may have seen um, that talks about you know, a, a software developer, somebody who's agreed to do homework for the rest of their lives. Um, that's a, a similar quote actually from an author who said writing, uh, authors uh, do the same thing. Uh, I'd bet if you asked a doctor, they'd say the same thing too. So you know, we may not be that special, uh, but we do definitely have a focus here. You're all here on a Saturday, um, uh, a Saturday afternoon. Why are you here? Um, uh, to, to talk about learning um, suggests that you want to, um, uh, to kind of learn new things. Um, which is really important. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I think learning at work uh, can be a, a challenge uh, for uh, for some people. Uh, the Great Resignation was a 2022 thing, I think. Uh, quiet quitting was a 2022 thing, but it's still happening. 40% um, of employees who took a new job in the last year, it's 2022, uh, are already looking for other opportunities. Um, uh, recent figures from from Gallup: six in ten people are disengaged at work. Um, uh, and if you're not engaged at work, then you're not sort of fulfilling your potential, potentially. Um, and uh, one technique uh, that you can use to, uh, to kind of do that, um, uh, and what the research suggests is uh, that people are leaving jobs because they want to upskill uh, or, or they want to reskill or they want new opportunities. Um, so um, we, uh, I guess, organizations, and I put myself in that organization, need to, um, to give people opportunities to learn new stuff because uh, that's going to get them engaged. And the question there is, I guess, if you're a developer at an organization and you're disengaged, are you actually getting training opportunities or learning opportunities? Uh, and uh, uh, if not, um, uh, try and find some. Uh, similarly, again, this might be a big org thing. Um, uh, learning and development's preoccupation uh, is generally with more uh, or better learning. Uh, and uh, the important thing to note there is, uh, and again, this is an article from Forbes talking about onboarding. Uh, I think it is, um, it's got to be context driven. It's got to be related to the work. Um, so just kind of giving you, shoveling you some content uh, and assuming that that's going to work to help you achieve your, your objectives um, isn't going to fly uh, and we need to do better, uh, which is a, a kind of a crucial thing uh, that, um, that we're looking at. Uh, and then, uh, Harold Jarsh, uh, who is again big in the learning world, um, uh, he wrote this uh, in a blog post in 2012. Uh, we need to learn as we work. Um, and uh, the idea that you know, we might spot a, spot a, th a, th a problem uh, with the way that we're working, uh, put together a week committee, uh, go off and do some planning, design a course, uh, come back and deliver that course, um, uh, and then hope that it works. Um, isn't going to fly anymore. Uh, the network age, the age of connection, means that these things happen much, much faster. Uh, and, and learning as we work uh, is, uh, is really important. Um, this blog post actually is the title for my talk, so I stole uh, the title. Um, it is Creative Commons share alike, so I should be OK with that. Um, uh, and the idea of the kind of hyperlinks, um, uh, subverted hierarchy, makes me think about um, a little bit about Marshall McLuhan, he talks about we become what we behold, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. Um, you know, so we're designing software tools and those software tools are then shaping the way we work. Uh, and uh, hyperlink is really a major sort of impact there in terms of making information uh, and knowledge open and accessible uh, in ways that it wasn't before. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's really important. And that's a really old thing. So Harold wrote that in 2012. Um, uh, Ari de Goose, I can't pronounce his name, I'm sorry, he's Dutch, um, uh, who was, he was a, an executive for Shell, um, wrote this in 1988, um, the ability to learn faster than competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. Um, uh, slightly cautious about this quote given um, that I think history will judge oil companies badly, but the concept is correct. Um, uh, Decision processes in organizations are learning processes. We're learning about the, the problems we're facing or the customer need, uh, and we need to adjust in order to deliver that. Um, uh, and uh, the only thing that really counts is speed of learning, uh, which, is, uh, which is really important. So learning learning's crucial. Learning on the job is crucial. Learning while we work uh, is crucial. Um, uh, David White uh, works for the University of the Arts in London, uh, so he's an artist. Um, and he talks about fine arts and things like that. Um, uh, he has been 
looking at some of the challenges around assessment uh, at universities with ChatGPT, because uh, that is scaring every lecturer uh, on the planet. Um, uh, and uh, interesting to my brother-in-law is a, ge a geography lecturer, uh, and uh, he's looking forward uh, to the day when a student can submit a lecture through ChatGPT, uh, and then he can assess it through ChatGPT, uh, and then he can go off and just do whatever he wants, and uh, doesn't have to talk to students anymore. Um, but, but that's actually a, a kind of a challenge, you know, and, and um, think about when you're doing domain modeling or um, threat modeling or architecture diagrams, oftentimes the artifact that you produce is less important than the conversation you had to produce that document. Um, uh, and so this idea that, that David comes up with, like the narrative is the learning, the, the process, the way we got there uh, is, the, um, is the thing that makes it important uh, and uh, of, uh, of crucial impact. Uh, to us um, as we're trying to learn as we work uh, and, uh, and build software. Um, and then I've got I've to go back at, at the end of it all uh, to talk about Agile. Uh, I, can't, I can't really escape the Agile manifesto, it just keeps coming back um, uh, all the time in the, in the things that we do. Um, learning is discovery, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. So there's like, there's like a social constructivist learning narrative embedded into um, the Agile Manifesto, uh, which I think maybe is, is why, I kind of, why it keeps coming back to me, because you know, we, ha we are embedding that, that concept of um, as we're building software, um, we are learning about what the customer needs are, we're learning about how we can build it better, uh, we're learning how to be better humans, we're learning how to, um, to work as a team uh, together, we're working, uh, learning how to kind of deal with people um, and, uh, and improve our, our processes uh, in every single way. Uh, so, um, so kind of it, it fits, fits with my mindset, I think, uh, which, uh, which makes it really important. And again, a quote from Jacob Singh, um, uh, agile software development is optimized for learning. Uh, you know, so we do those retrospectives and say, okay, what did we do last time that we could do better next time? Uh, and, um, uh, and kind of build some stuff up. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm nearly done. Um, I've just got two more slides, one more slide. Uh, one more slide. I thought it would be inappropriate for me to, to dump a load of quotes and references and talk through some, uh, some ideas about learning without suggesting one or two ways um, that we could make um, learning work. Uh, and just a couple of thoughts. Um, make it people's job uh, to learn and share that learning with others. Uh, so if, if people don't have a, a, a task or a requirement, then they won't do it generally. Uh, so if they get some reward for it, if it's part of their objectives, um, then uh, they're, um, they're more likely to, to kind of do it. Uh, if you want to spread learning, uh, you've got to show your work. Um, so at Instill, we've, we've over the last 12 to 18 months really kind of doubled down on um, a lot of internal blogging uh, to, uh, to kind of show our work, to, to show the learning that we're, we're going through, to, to talk to each other about new and interesting things uh, and to talk about failures and successes. Uh, and that's been, that's been really good. And um, uh, I think it's, it's made us a better organization uh, just by, by trying to be a wee bit more open. Uh, defaulting to open, uh, again, probably not revealing corporate secrets, but um, you know, the idea that if someone asks you a, a question on a Slack channel or a private message on Slack, you bring that conversation into an open space um, so that other people can contribute uh, or that um, other people can learn from that stuff. Uh, if you have a document, a comment or a conversation in a, in a, in a room, um, write it up uh, and share that uh, with, um, with other people who maybe weren't in the room. Uh, so try and, try and be open uh, and transparent with things. Always works well uh, to uh, improve stuff. Uh, and then finally, um, Try and make time for learning. Uh, so again, Hannah talked about some of the things that the teams do at Instill uh, to, uh, in her talk um, uh, about breathing space and things like that. Uh, those can be really good. Uh, you know, so it doesn't have to be a course, although I would love it if it was. Come talk to me. Sorry, no sales. Um, but, but going to conferences, you're here. Um, reading books, uh, listening to podcasts. Does your company offer a training budget? Uh, does it offer a book budget? Um, uh, do you have the option of taking time out from the JIRA treadmill uh, to, uh, to kind of spend some time learning new stuff? Uh, and if not, um, can you ask for it uh, and, uh, and try and get it? Because um, I, think, I think that's crucial. Uh, and 
really useful uh, for, for kind of helping uh, out. Uh, so I just, last slide but one, just to come back to this concept, you know, um, learning is work, as in it is hard work and you have to, to stretch yourself. Um, and the work that we do uh, in software uh, is learning. Uh, it's about learning about the product and the customer uh, and learning how to do things better. Uh, and uh, and we, should, uh, we should pick up on that uh, and, uh, and drive it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Very much appreciate that. Um, just opening up two questions from the floor. Um, Olivia here will bring a mic to you if you have any questions. Just raise your hand. Oh, of course. So qu question then about how what you've just covered relates to the, the nature of expertise, because at the moment you find a lot of developers, they're not learning from the old books, they're chasing frameworks or the latest serverless widget or whatever, so they, they don't get the time for the deep learning in some particular thing, and AI is likely to only make that worse because you'll be asking the AI and evaluating the results and then moving on. So how do you think the, the nature of expertise is changing if it is, and uh, what does that mean for my kind a learning theory perspective? Um, well, I'm inclined to say, how, how will they know unless we tell them, maybe? So, so we need to recognize our expertise and, and be more proactive in sharing that. Uh, I, think, I think the network effect type or the network, the theory of network, um, information wants to be free was the phrase we used to band around. Uh, so I think the idea that there is expertise that lives in one place is, is defunct maybe um, and uh, and yeah we, we've used we've used expertise as a kind of a gatekeeper in the past and I think um, with the way that things like AI are going that's democratizing things so um, you know there are people here who give presentations today who uh, I've been incredibly impressed with and I've been stressed about my talk because I thought they're younger and less experienced and they're much better than me so I don't think I don't think expertise is like a a thing that we can own anymore. It's just, it's just, uh, no, that's, that's airy fairy. It's just there. It's a bad answer. I apologize. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's going to be more open uh, and we've got to, we've got to just share that knowledge as much as we can. It's a poor answer. Thank you. No, thank you. Any other questions? I, um, I noticed you quoted Marshall McLuhan about like, medium is the message type. Um, you know, you know I, I'm sure you must have heard of like Neil Postman where he was talking about how the discourse, for example, in America or in general has changed as society has moved from a society that pro prioritized communication by text, like by books, like in the old days, the presidential debates, you know, people would be giving speeches but now you have a case where um, the president has to look good on television. And if you, what they talk about, if you look at the presidential speeches of the last few presidents, they're all speeches that could be, like, that are very, very easy to, or very simple, in fact, maybe oversimplified. So w w I was wondering what you think about the new world we live in, where we have so many screens around us. I mean, it's like a multiplicity of televisions so many distractions, like, so many, like mobile phones, etc., social media. How easy is it for a person to actually learn and focus on one thing, you know, like what we were talking about, deep work okay. earlier? Yeah, so um, there was a phrase like, the, the world that we live in now is like constant partial attention, you know, where you're always focused on one thing, but, but, but there's something else buzzing around you. So that, I mean, that, that I think is a, um, a, a negative effect of the way the world is, um, and uh, yeah. So, so one of the benefits, I guess, of of uh, and again, not wanting to to kind of to do the sales pitch, but of dedicated classroom training sessions, whether they're online or in person, is that you do get that chance to to block out distractions uh, and um, to facilitate learning in a way. Because I know when when we've run. Um, learning sessions that have required homework, for example, um, that uh, we find people don't do them uh, because they're too busy with their day job. 
so yeah, I think I think there is definitely a challenge to um, to finding the time that you can step out from that and to to deliberately clear your mind and, and put away distractions um, to to allow you to do that. Is that is that what your question was? There was a wee bit of um, the echo didn't really make it clear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Just one over here. Okay. I am. Um, I was just curious, as a lecturer yourself, do you feel a shift towards uh, more of a focus on team-based learning? Because as you say, we, we learn best when we're teaching others, and we learn best when we are learning together as a collective. Do you, as a lecturer, feel we're going in the direction more of team-based learning, or do you still stand by more normalized lecture events? It's a weird one. I, I mean, so we, we deliver training courses, so I'm not a lecturer in the sense that I'm not a, like a university lecturer. So um, on our training courses, we, we try our best to make it as practical as possible. So you're going you're gonna to be doing stuff as soon as practically possible. Sometimes there, there is that kind of, how do, I, how do I quickly get you from point A to point B so that you can do the exercise that we've specified? Um, and for that, actually, you know, either we give you some reading in advance, which you won't do because you don't have time, um, or or we produce, or we we kind of give you a lecture. Um, so, yeah, I think I think I think the right approach is is to kind of to get a blend um, of of um, teaching that's delivered versus learning that is practical. Um, but um, yeah, I think the emphasis needs to be more on on just in time learning or, or learning on the job, which which doesn't facilitate lecture type stuff. It's got to be, um, I've got a problem I need to solve it. Give me just enough to get me to the point when I can solve it uh, and give me the scaffolding that I have, uh, and, uh, the scaffolding as in through support and tooling uh, to, to get me to the, um, to the solution as quick as possible because we don't have time to, um, to go off and, and study for weeks to, to do something. We've just got to deliver software today is the, is the challenge. Is there a final question? If not, I'll just thank Ryan for taking us through that and for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.